Good afternoon, my name is Fred Axelgard, and again, I'm happy to welcome you to this concluding panel for the conference. The purpose here is to talk about methodologies involved in doing global Mormon studies research. We have a distinguished panel here. I will briefly mention their names. You have their biographies in front of you. Um, professor Henry Gurin is an associate professor at Oakland University in the state of Michigan, not the Bay Area. We need to clarify that. And um, Caroline Klein is a PhD candidate here at Claremont. And she has been focusing on women's studies in religion. Matthew Martnick, I almost got that pronounced correctly, has a doctorate in psychology from the University of the Rockies, is engaged in providing mental health services in Colorado where he lives. Also very active online in tracing the global growth of Mormonism and at Camora.com is an amazing array of uh, resources providing information on the international church. We're very happy to have all of these uh, distinguished scholars here. The plan is to be interactive. What I will do is ask a question designed to stimulate some conversation. We'll move down the panel and they'll answer the question and then respond to each other's answers before moving on. We've had a chance to coordinate a bit uh, in the last week or so. We hope the questions seem interesting to you, but there will be time at the end again for your involvement. So let me go ahead and begin. And here's the first question by way of background. How did you get started doing research on global Mormonism? Why did it or why does it interest you? And or why do you feel it's important? Professor Gorin, could you start for us? Uh, that's right. Um, oops, yeah, I was told to speak in the microphone. I guess this works. Um, so when I was an anthropology undergraduate at Utrecht University in the Netherlands, I really wanted to study Pentecostal growth in Costa Rica. But my supervisor, Professor Walter van Beek, who was a Mormon, said, well, those Pentecostal, those Pentecostal churches don't always like anthropologists. Why don't you study a Mormon congregation? And he just happened to be a stake president in Utrecht in the Netherlands. And he said, well, I'll write you a letter of introduction uh, in English, which we translated in Spanish. Then I went to Costa Rica. That opened all sorts of doors for me. And later, I was asked to do a PhD study because of my experience in Costa Rica looking at small-scale entrepreneurs in Guatemala City, where I studied Catholics, Pentecostals, and Mormons, so I was able to use that experience. And from then on, it just seemed the Mormons kept cropping up in my life. Now again, as an anthropologist, I was of course interested, first of all, at that time, we're talking early 1990s, in the growth in Latin America. But I also felt that behind the official st church statistics, which we're gonna talk about, I'm sure, there were many other stories to tell. And as an anthropologist, I felt, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about methods, that I had a unique perspective talking to people, interviewing them, doing ethnographic research. But again, my original interest was simply, this is a very different church. I learned that very quickly. Uh, it is very successful in Latin America, partly for the same reasons of, as Pentecostalism, partly for different reasons, and for comparative purposes, I thought that was important to study. Now back to the other issue, access. So I was incredibly fortunate to have that connection through my supervisor, who happened to be a state president, that I could get access, because otherwise there is no way I could have had access to that, to that ward in San Jose, Costa Rica, or in Guatemala City, or later in Managua. So, and uh, the relevance of Mormonism, I don't want to talk too long, we'll get all into that, but I am interested, I'll repeat, in the comparative perspective. Mormons are not as unique as they like to think. They have things in common with other religions, with Pentecostals, with uh, Charismatic Catholics and the Catholic Charismatic Renewal, and I think um, it is important to study that comparatively using rigorous research methodologies. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Caroline, please. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, for years, I had been reading and writing and thinking about issues of gender within Mormonism. Um, I myself was raised in the Mormon church. I was married in the Mormon temple. And I think I spent most of my 20s grappling with questions of gender. 
before I decided to enroll uh, in CGU in the Women's Studies and Religion program here. Um, what I came, as, as I took classes here in Women's Studies and Religion, I came to be very interested in um, the ways that context and culture and race and class impact one's experience with gender in a religion. And I was pretty familiar with the ways um, that white Mormon women in North America navigated Mormonism, um, white Mormon feminists. I, was, I, was, I knew that world pretty well, but I was not so familiar with how race, class, and gender intersected together outside of white North America. So that is what I decided to focus on for my dissertation. Um, I decided to examine this question uh, by looking at three different uh, communities of women in different locations. One location was in Veracruz, Mexico. One location was in Botswana. And uh, one was women of color in the United States. I felt like this was a really important contribution because so many of these voices and perspectives had not been heard before outside of their immediate communities. And I felt like uh, they were absent from a lot of academic conversations and that they deserved um, a voice at the table when we were talking about Mormonism and gender. Um, I, so I felt like it could speak internally to Mormon studies in important ways and internally to Mormons in general. But I also saw that there was potential for speaking outwards to the academy. I was hoping that these voices could enrich and critique um, uh, feminist critiques of religion in new ways. Thank you very much. Matt, please, go ahead. So I first became interested in the international church and the study of, of global Mormonism when I was in high school. Um, and I had the thought one day, I remember thinking back to looking at an Enzyme article and it had a map of where all the <coughs> temples were in the world. and. I thought to myself, you know, I, I wonder where all the temples are now because President Hinckley had announced like 100 or something like that, and they're all over the place now, so where are these temples at? And one thing kind of led to another, and I became familiar with uh, David, Stewart's web, David Stewart's website, Kamora.com, and uh, I just developed a very intense interest in this subject and looking at the growth of the church and where the church had the most members, where there weren't any members, how come. And um, in about 2007, I decided, you know, I should really organize my thoughts and put it together in some, set of, some sort of online format. That way I can publish my ideas and get people's feedback as well on that. And so that's when I started ldschurchgrowth.blogspot.com. And I've maintained that site now for over 10 years. Um, and then I met with, uh, I got together with David Stewart in 2009. And since then, I've been working with the Kimura Foundation, where we conduct um, research in regards to what contextual factors affect the growth of global Mormonism, as well as, um, you know, just also looking at the effectiveness of the missionary program and um, publishing resources on that um, during that time. So um, since that time, I'm still working on different articles and books in regards to that, that topic. And um, it's just continued to grow as a major interest of mine, even though it's not my day job, so. <laughs> Thank you. Any, anything somebody forgot to say, wanted to follow up with? Okay. Um, I'd like to ask, what are the questions, what are the main research questions that, that you have tried to address in, in a large sense? What are, what are the important issues or concerns that, uh, that have driven you in your research? You've alluded to that to some degree, but if you could elaborate as, as needed. Please, Henry. Like I said, the growth, the enormous growth of the church in Latin America and the feeling that there were many other stories and elements to the statistics just looking at the growth. Maybe also add that, of course, the Mormon church being so North American, right, and connected to the United States, having success in Latin America, a continent that people tend to think of as very Catholic, although you can debate just how Catholic it was. Uh, but certainly Mormonism is very different from Catholicism, so I was intrigued by that whole process of conversion. When I looked at the growth issue, what I found that, you know, people were attracted for, to Mormonism for all sorts of reasons, from very practical to spiritual to related to doctrine to, you know, social reasons, essentially reflecting a lot of what we know from the conversion research in general, why people convert. But what I found when I actually did the research in the wards were for some very interesting issues kind of the stories behind the growth. 
to put it in context, or what I would like to call uh, in some of the dialogue articles I published, the growing pains. So I noticed, for instance, that in my study of Mormons in Costa Rica, Guatemala, Nicaragua, the very limited knowledge of new LDS members, after they had six discussions at that time, now it's only four discussions, they knew very little about the church or the doctrines. The problems they had with tithing, living up to the word of wisdom in Latin America, and the gendered aspects to that, especially between men and women, uh, I thought were very fascinating. The problems many people had functioning in callings, right? Part of the policy at that time was for bishops to put new members almost immediately in callings, sometimes very responsible callings, and that was a struggle. Sometimes it worked out well. I think it also caused a lot of inactivity, frankly, in Latin America. Problems with um, lingering cultural issues like machismo and authoritarianism of leaders. And I say a lot of the leaders, again, were very young, not that well prepared, so you had a lot of leadership issues, which again, people have published about in early research on Mormonism in Latin America, thinking uh, especially Wesley Craig and Evelyn Tullis have both uh, documented that part also. And again, the uh, last main issue, the inactivity rates, right? The people that, the fact that so many new members drop out, that you really get what I called in one um, piece, three types of members. You have the disaffiliated members, you have the affiliated members with a kind of minimal kind of involvement, and you have the core members that live up to all the expectations and the ones who have a temple recommend, but that's just a tiny minority in Latin America. So really, when we talk about Mormonism in Latin America, apart from you know country and class and ethnicity issues and gender issues, what kind of Mormons are we talking about? I think is an important question that we need much more research on. Over time, have your has the question evolved, or have the questions that you're interested in evolved, or has it been a consistent focus on? That has been a pretty consistent focus. The only uh, thing that changed, well, changed, that I added more on was the comparative aspect, not just looking at Mormonism in isolation, which I think, frankly, is a problem, especially in Latin America, but even in the States, but seeing how Mormons compete with other main religions, whether successful or not, like Pentecostalism. I've written about comparing Mormons and Adventists in Chile in a dialogue article, which I think is very useful. Jehovah's Witnesses also have certain elements that I think for comparative purposes, again, from a social science perspective, right? I'm not talking theology, I'm an anthropologist. I think that's very important to bring out both the elements where Mormons are actually quite unique and the elements where they have that they have in common with Pentecostals or Adventists or Witnesses or other what I would just call strict you know, Christian religions. Thank you. Caroline, same question, the questions that you've had. Uh, my main research questions have been uh, how do questions of gender, and by that I mean um, male leadership, gender role prescriptions, um, gendered theological ideas and so forth, how do these questions of gender register to women outside of white North America? That was probably my dominant question as I went into the dissertation. Can I ask, just, did you have a suspicion that it was a different resonance? Is, did that you know, drive you? It definitely, I mean, certainly my, 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 my vision was opened by, uh, by the end of this project in new ways. Um, I, I suspected things would register differently, but the things that came out um, surprised me in a lot of ways. For instance, uh, and I'll and I'll get to that in just a second. Like another dominant question, which will go right to what you asked, was um, what kinds of liberation and power did women in the global south find in Mormonism? And that was those things really surprised me that came out. For instance, I talked to women in Mexico, and it turned out that Relief Society was this amazing vehicle for economic empowerment. I, that, that was something that I had no clue, I wasn't expecting that, but their experience with Relief Society in which they were taught crafts and um, cooking skills and how to do haircuts, uh, they would learn these things and then they would turn them into businesses. And through these businesses, they would get really important economic uplift in their families. And so um, I loved finding these kinds of trends uh, as I was asking these questions. Other questions that I was interested in as I was doing this project um, was, you know, what were the places of tension and conflict as they adopted and adapted Mormonism into their particular contexts? Um, I also, and this was a big one, I really wanted to understand what their ethical and moral imperatives were. Like, what was driving them? When they came across a moral decision that they had to make, what were their priorities? Um, and I think that in the end, my, uh, that answering that question might be one of my biggest contributions uh, as I look back on this dissertation. Um, I was also throughout interested in questions of female agency, 
um, and how they negotiated in really complex ways between various loyalties, how they would at times push against things, but other times they would uphold it and they would do everything in between. And I, I think that that complexity um, really came out in the project as well. Great, thank you. Matt, please. Um, so with my questions, like I mentioned earlier, I was really wanting more information about the church and what that growth really looked like in terms of uh, the size of the church, how rapidly um, the church was growing in different areas of the world, and um, especially when I was writing the Almanac with David Stewart, where we look at the growth of the church in every sovereign country of the world, um, that really provided a lot of very interesting information in looking at you know, things that I would have never thought of. I never would have thought of there would be a higher percentage of members of the church in Pakistan than there is in India, you know, or, um, you know, Indonesia or whatever, you know. So it's um, just interesting to see what's affected that growth and how that, you know, even things like uh, religious freedom restrictions, that can actually accelerate growth in some countries because it requires the members of the church to do that missionary work and not to have full-time missionaries do it. So, um, so like I was saying, you know, a lot of it had to do with really understanding where the church was growing and why, um, and also just how we measure that growth too was it was a big part of that and looking at effective ways to really see how many members there are because there are some significant disparities between church reported membership numbers and government reported membership numbers in terms of census data that's collected for self-affiliating members so looking at that those disparities can be very interesting um, and really give a lot of information about the the health and the status of the church in different countries around the world so um, you know, really a lot of it's just sort of understanding the contextual factors, what's what's encouraging growth, what's not, and why is that, and what things can do uh, missionaries and church leaders do that encourage growth or that unfortunately stifle growth and making sure that, you know, people are aware of that. You know, it's really kind of where things are at now, I'd say, is letting people know, you know, this, these are effective ways of handling things. These are really ineffective ways of handling things. Matt, Matt, as time's gone along, as, as, as you've learned, have you been able to ask better questions, more sharply focused questions about yeah. you know, the whys to the, sure. to yeah. the growth and, and non-growth? One of those is why is a church so limited in where it does missionary work? Most countries in the world only have a church presence in a handful of cities. And it's so why is that? And then you learn about the center of strength, the center of strength policy, which most members of the church don't know anything about. And that is really determined how missionary work has been carried out in the church in the last 25, 30 years. Um, you know, the, mat the patterns for missionary work we saw in England in the 1830s and 1840s, um, those don't have hardly anything to do with the patterns of missionary work today. Back then it was going to the rural areas, establishing congregations in small villages. Today it is very difficult for a mission president to get approval to open a village to missionary work. It never happens, pretty much. Thank you. Matt, let's come back to Nigeria a little bit later. Could we do that? OK, thank you. Um, next question, again, it's related, but maybe to distinguish between the research questions you've had in mind and the methodologies, the methods you've been using, or maybe, again, how they might have changed over time, um, and what are the main challenges that you've had in trying to use these methodologies? OK, please, Henry. So again, I am a Dutch cultural anthropologist doing research on Mormonism and other religions in Latin America. So as a anthropologist, uh, I use I do ethnographic research, uh, which means I do a lot of hanging out with people. Uh, with Mormons, that's mostly hanging out in church, uh, the regular three hour on Sunday, but also any kind of other meetings that basically they allow me to visit. Um, hang out, take notes, figure out what's going on, and then interview people both informally and more formally in a like, you know, recorded setting and uh, record it and make transcripts. Uh, I think it's a great method. The main problem is access, which I already explained. I was incredibly fortunate to have that first access, which has served me basically throughout my life to have access to those Mormon wards. Not everybody cooperates. That's always a problem. But the people you talk to, and especially if you just hang out in any ward or Mormon ward or in any Pentecostal or Catholic group, if you're there hanging out long enough, even though, of course, you look different than most people since I do research in Latin America, they forget why you're there. They, you become part of the networks. You People tell you things. And then the other part, of course, um, 
I also had access to the mission. So I could go with the missionaries. I would uh, go with them when they're trekking. I would go when they're doing vis visits. Uh, I would interview the mission president. In the beginning, they allowed that. After a while, it became actually impossible to interview mission presidents, which I thought was interesting. Uh, or it was possible to interview them, but they didn't say very much, not to a Dutch anthropologist anyway. Um, <laughs> so I think that is one thing to keep in mind, how that evolves. Um, you asked about challenges. Again, um, it's been a while. I wonder, would I have the same kind of access nowadays? I'm not sure. The last couple of times, it, it seemed to be getting harder. Um, my main puzzle here that I'll just throw up, even though I'll get back to it a number of times, is w my main puzzle here for the you know global Mormon studies, why are there not more studies on the international church? Why is it so limited? Why is it that in the 90s there were basically three people doing research on Mormonism in Latin America, Mark Grover, David Knowlton, and Henry Gorin, and it's still pretty much, now I know there are some exceptions, there are some other research that, you know, part of which we've heard here, there are studies on Mexico, there are some Latinos in the US, but as far as studies on Mormonism in Latin America, the big growth area where, you know, a big chunk of the membership lives, it's amazing to me that there is not much visible. And I will throw that up as a question here. Why is that? What can we do to change that? Do you have any speculative answer on your part? Well, as I, you know, talking to Patrick about it, money is an issue, <laughs> right? It's hard to do research on Mormonism. You fall between the cracks on a whole bunch of funding sources, very hard. The other issue is access. And let's just say the sensibility of the church on being scrutinized, especially by social scientists, whether those are LDS or non-LDS, as you probably surmised, I am not LDS, which I think has been a great help for me in being able to ex If you get the access as an outsider, as a non-member, I think it's a great value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Value. because it means you have, you're much freer to write about it. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of frustrating that I share all my information and the good folks of the uh, research information division, that's some of which I know very well, of course, have very detailed information, but they cannot share it. Yet, of yeah. course, they can use my information and my research because it's all in the public domain. So my point is, I'm sure there are fascinating studies being done, but within the church that are not shared with a wider audience. Which ties, of course, to the question of what is global Mormon studies, right? Is it about helping the spread of Mormonism, or is it about studying Mormonism? And those are two different things, obviously. Thank you. Caroline, please. Uh, my main research uh, method was the oral life history interview. Um, I'd sit down with women for one to two hours, and I would ask them about the whole arc of their lives, starting from childhood, going through the present. I'd also throw in a few questions about gender and what it was like to be a woman in the church and so forth. Um, and, then, and then I would transcribe these interviews and study them and look for themes. Um, and I also did some participant observations, so ethnographic methods also. Um, in terms of challenges, I think that you brought up some really important issues with access. Um, I was lucky when it came to Botswana, um, I, I was part of a research team that had an in with the church, and so they got us access in Botswana. And so I just worked through the church, and it was actually the missionaries over in Botswana that that arranged all of these interviews, so that was amazing. When it came to Mexico, um, I decided, well, I did not work uh, through the institutional church. I just worked in, through informal networks. And so it's a, it's a challenge to find these networks uh, where you have this in, where you can find someone who will open this community to you and facilitate interviews. Um, it worked out in Mexico. I think that the leadership of the ward where I was at was a little wary, but the women actually just took control and they said, look, she's coming and uh, you better give her a room to talk to people and you better welcome her. And so the bishop did. And so it worked out even if it wasn't through institutional channels. Another challenge um, with my method is, and this is something I think about a lot, um, it's the fact that um, my positionality is a white North American um, middle-class American woman was different than that of the women I was talking to in Mexico and Botswana and the women of color in the United States. And so there was very much like a very real possibility that when I was doing these interviews, they were selectively um, sharing stories. Like they were deciding what to tell me as, as they should because I'm coming from a different place and position than they were. And so... Um, 
that that is something that I always had to to keep in mind and and to realize as I was writing up uh, what I was finding. I think if another an example of this is when I was in Mexico. I really wanted the women to reflect on race. I really wanted them to reflect on power and privilege and white leadership in America. But I could not get them to talk about that. Um, and I think it might have been out of a sense of politeness because here I am as a white North American lady, um, but. But I felt like that was a real gap, and it just it it brought home to me this idea that um, positionality really matters. And if it was a different person who was doing the interviewing, if it was not an outsider, if it was an insider from their community doing these interviews, a very different document could have emerged. And so I think that's just like a really important thing to be keeping in mind when you do this kind of work. Great, thank you. So I would agree that really one of the biggest challenges is the lack of access to the, the data that's out there to, to study global Mormonism. Um, just because the church releases such a limited amount of data on its membership and its activity and, um, and just different statistics that give us a good idea of how the church is doing in terms of its growth and, and member activity rates. But um, so initially, about 10 years ago, I mean, the main way I would gather data to analyze the methodology I'd use would be the, you know, doing whatever I can to, um, to analyze such as the statistics that were released by the church, um, and also to thoroughly browse the web looking for social media websites and blogs from missionaries, and that was actually very helpful and very interesting to get a lot of those um, personal accounts, um, and also a lot of actually fairly detailed information about activity rates and and um, more qualitative data about you know leadership and how that's functioning and different challenges going on. Um, and then, you know, most recently, um, you know, surveys have been one of the greatest way that we've been able to gather a large amount of data. And when I first launched the, a survey about five years ago, I mean, I used my own blog to try to get that as well as like Reddit and different things like that to get responses. And I get a few hundred after a week or two and then it would all kind of fizzle out. Um, but in the last few years, I've been using Facebook advertising to target people who like the LDS Church on Facebook, and I've gotten about 6,000 responses now um, in the last five years from all over the world, from Laos, Pakistan, um, Nigeria, Belarus, I mean, everywhere. So that's provided us with a huge amount of data to analyze, um, and the questions we ask in the survey are very specific and ask questions about why are people come to church anymore, why, you know, why are why is it difficult for people to be retained? Um, you know, what does member missionary participation look like? Um, you know, what are some cultural factors that you believe encourage growth? What are some that deter growth? So I mean, really surveys have been a, a major part of that, but also over the years we've established personal contacts in different countries. My favorite one I have right now is in Mali, and he's been a part of the creation of the first branch in Mali last year. Um, as well as the first convert baptismal service that happened last month in Mali. Um, and so some of those personal contacts have provided a rich amount of information that we can, that we can mine <laughs> and analyze. So, um, but we also use other sources that are available in the public domain. Um, you know, ethnologue.com has a lot of great data on, um, on language use. Um, also the government censuses, which I mentioned before. Um, you know, just kind of whatever we can find and, Putting it all together. So. Henry, as a social scientist, take a, take a whack, would you? Uh, you know, I don't want to g jump ahead to question number four, but limitations, yeah, access is, can be a limitation, right? If, you know, I have to get permission. Now, I said I've been lucky, but occasionally I do get to uh, wards where the bishop doesn't want a, a, an anthropologist there hanging around. And, and of course, yeah, I have to go through IRB and, and official approval. So I do have to tell people, right, you don't have to agree to be into with me. And if you're uncomfortable talking about something, you don't have to talk about it. I think that actually strengthens the research, right? But it's true. A lot of it depends on the people I get to talk to, how representative is then the information I'm able to get, because the people who say no, there's no way I can go around that, right? If they say no, then I can't interview them. I've been lucky in being able to interview uh, a lot of bishops and you know people on the Elders Quorum and Relief Society and all sorts of people. Um, a lot of the what people forget, I think, and here again, I think that there's a, an, a link to dabbling and, uh, and being an artist. A lot of the quality of interviews and participant observation depends on the quality and skills of the researcher. 
So I hope I am a good, you know, participant, observation, participant observator. Observer. I hope observer. I hope uh, my interview skills are good. I hope my language skills, right? Keep in mind, I'm a Dutchman speaking English here, doing interviews in Spanish, and then writing about it in English again. <laughs> so there's some challenges there. Um, I talk, people also forget, right, in the environment of middle class America and, you know, the, the issues of race and ethnicity, I interview mostly white, uh, poor people, right? Low income, middle income people in Central America. Uh, yes, most are mestizo, right, mixed blood. Some are white, some are, very few are Native American. Um, so yes, how they respond to me. I think what always helps, I think, is that I can always present myself as the ultimate outsider, right? I am not LDS, uh, I am a social scientist, I am not Costa Rican or Nicaraguan, uh, but I'm not North American either, so I'm kind of an outsider, which, and I'm an anthropologist, which for you know, the times I'm able to explain what anthropology is about, really helps drive home the fact that I'm an outsider. And I'm interested in understanding people. I want to understand the situation. And I'm sure Caroline and Kalina found the same thing, that when you interview people who are very different from you, who are poor, who belong to different you know, class, ethnicities, different countries, they welcome that attention. They're happy to tell their story. So I also do live inter history interviews. But again, it all comes back to the skills of the researcher and the selections we make and how well we represent it. And there's a problem, of course, a political problem in that we're representing other people, right? Because as was mentioned here, I would love there to be I'm sure there's plenty of people who could research, do research in Latin America, in the wards, whether they're LDS or not, that doesn't matter. But doing that research, I think it'd be great if we could get more of that. A bit of that is happening, but that'd be a different discussion on why isn't more happening of that. And I assume part of it is, to simplify very much, the LDS people who want to do the research are uncomfortable about getting in trouble with the church. The non-LDS people are probably more interested in studying their own church or studying other churches, but not necessarily Mormonism, because it is kind of an odd religion in many countries still, in spite of the membership growth. I'll keep it there for now. Great, thanks. Does anybody want to make any comment about quantitative methods at this point? Um, yeah, the use of statistics, you talk, you've talked a little bit about difficult a use of quantitative. Ooh, data. math. We don't do math. <laughs> <laughs> not, well, I, I like quantitative methodology, but unfortunately, the numbers that we have access to are quite limited to be able okay. to perform any meaningful statistical analyses other than, and you probably do some, t you know, different um, studies in terms of comparing country to country with the limited data that are available, but it's just so limited. You'd have to get it all yourself and crunch okay. the numbers, so. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, basically, then, to ask... How successful do you feel you've been in your research in getting answers? Again, this has come through in, in some of what you've said already, but how successful has your research been in addressing the questions that you, uh, that you set, out to, set out to address? Again, considering all the limitations I have as an outsider, an anthropologist, a Dutchman, a non-LDS, I think it has been quite successful. I think it's actually helped being an outsider, and as I mentioned, I think it's actually helped being non-LDS because I was lucky to get the access. But I agree, the access is a big problem. People being able, being comfortable to talk about issues is a problem. I actually was surprised to find one of the things I really remember is that a lot of the, uh, the leaders I interviewed, especially in Costa Rica, and Guatemala were actually among the most critical about the church institutionally, right? The rise of the, the management class, as it was mentioned earlier, right? The, the whole North American perspective, the middle class perspective, you know, uh, from visuals to, you know, the assumption that people live near church or can just drive over there, which again, in many parts of Africa, Latin America, Asia is totally not true. People have to travel for hours to get to church, to get to simple meetings. So that creates whole different circumstances, right? So I think, um, getting back to that, I think it's been an advantage. Now, um, talk about limitations. I think you have to be aware of the fact that you are interviewing people. And you're doing it in a certain situation where you're hoping that you're making them comfortable and that they'll share what they want. It's a matter of trust, building up rapport is what anthropologists call it. But ultimately, 
you have to combine a lot of different sources, different types of research. And like I said, I would just hope that there'd be more research coming out, right? On Mormonism, on other religions, so we can compare across the line different countries, different wards, different stakes. The issue I hinted at, different types of Mormons, right? I am particularly fascinated, yeah, why do people drop out? And that would be something to study, but it's just impossible to access because for starters, a lot of those inactive members are hard to find, for me personally as an anthropologist. What I'm fascinated by are what I call the affiliated members. So they still consider themselves LDS, but they don't go to church every Sunday. They may occasionally drink alcohol or coffee. Um, they're kind of in this liminal in-between phase, yet they still self-identify as Mormon. I find that very fascinating. And then, yeah, the other fascinating part, of course, the core members, right? The people who have the temple recommends and how do they deal with all the, the cultural contradictions and the different stresses and you know tensions that they have to deal with in daily life and in church. So again, I think you know, dabbling and being an artist can be combined with doing science and in a comparative theoretical framework. I think we're just at the beginning of it. Like I said, we need a lot more studies we need a lot more data, we know the limitations of the quantitative data, and we need the qualitative data to go together with that, to get ahead. Thank you. Caroline, please. Uh, in terms of, so how successful do I feel I've been using uh, these methods? Um, I think I was able to gather a lot of really great illuminating um, anecdotes and insights from the women I spoke with. I think this is one reason why I love oral histories. There's uh, just there's this potential of illuminating um, the thoughts and insights of people who are not usually considered in um, institutional histories. And so this is one of, I think, the, one of the most wonderful things about um, oral life history methods. Um, and that said, though, there were certainly um, moments of disconnect, you know, as I was doing these interviews. Uh, I kind of, I'm a little embarrassed now and I'm a little uncomfortable by the fact that, like, I, I, in every single interview I did with these women, I asked them every single time if they felt equal to men in the Mormon church. And sometimes, like, they were quite happy to answer that question, but a lot of the time, they would kind of furrow their eyebrows and look at me and pause and not really know what to say. And this was a moment of disconnect because that question was coming from me and my questions and my issues and it did not reflect their questions and their issues and they, and they knew it. The second I asked that question, they knew I was coming from a different place. And so there were, so, so there were these moments of disconnect um, that could come out, but actually in the end, it was these moments of disconnect that helped, to, helped me to articulate maybe one of the problems with um, the ways um, feminist critiques of religion have been, has been framing itself over the last several years. And I, was, and I came to understand, actually, and this is one of the things that I think my, hopefully my dissertation um, will really contribute to is that I, the moral imperatives of the women I spoke with, if I had to generalize, they were not gender equality. That would be my moral imperative. Their moral imperatives turned out to be different. And the way I, the, the phrase I came up with to try to describe their moral imperatives um, was non-oppressive connectedness. They were interested in relationships that were uplifting and positive. They were interested in communities that they could be a part of in healthy ways. They were interested in great marriages and good relationships with children and in great relationships with the divine and with themselves, um, and, and they had to be non-oppressive and non-violent. That's what they wanted, and that is what often Mormonism seemed to deliver for them. These communities, these relationships that they felt um, were positive and uplifting. So I feel like, yeah, like I feel like I did get a great, a great answer from some of the work I did using these methods. Um, the minuses, I think, have, have been addressed to some degree of this kind of methodology. It's not highly systematic when you're doing ethnography. You don't get great quantitative data from doing um, oral life histories. There's also, and no one really tells you this beforehand, but transcribing is horrific. I mean, it is so, Tunnelin, you're laughing back there. You know this. It takes so much time. I think I spent a whole year of my life transcribing. And so this was extraordinarily time consuming. Um, and, and finally, of course, uh, just another kind of limitation is uh, 
it, it, this is a great ethnographic methodologies are wonderful or life history methodologies are wonderful but just to to go in with a lot of caution because like you mentioned when you represent people and especially when you're coming in as an outsider and representing people you have to be so careful to be ethical and fair and not be exploiting them and not be extracting them because there's a long history of research that um, exoticizes or demeans um, people from other countries, and I'm speaking as a white, you know, North American person. So, so this is something that I've always kept in the background, and we have to be very careful of. I think. Um, so I would say I think it's been really successful for me with the methodology I've used, um, especially when you get six thousand surveys, you learn all about all sorts of interesting things going on uh, with that much data from so many different areas of the world. Um, but I mean, some of the findings I think that are pretty significant are, I mean, we have a good idea of how many active members there are in the church worldwide. There's about, you know, about 5.3 million active members in the church of about 16 million members. So that's, I think, valuable to know. Uh, we know that inside the, in the United States, the activity rate's about 40% of members are active. Outside the United States, it's more like 20 to 25% active. Um, so I think we got some good information on what the activity rates look like. Convert retention, Can most. Can you repeat those numbers again? All of them? <laughs> <laughs> he needs help uh, transcribing. Go ahead. Sure. 20 to 25 percent. Yeah, so 40 percent United States, about one third of members worldwide, and about 20 to 25 percent outside the United States are active. Meaning they go to church, you know, usually, like, you know, most weeks they go to church is defining activity in that way. Um, so, I mean, I think that's been really important. And then kind of retention rates worldwide, it's about half stay active a year later. Some areas it's actually close to 100%, believe it or not. And in other areas it's more like 10%. So a lot of variability there in terms of convert retention. Um, but some of the other findings in terms of what really drives growth in the LDS church, um, you know, high baptismal <coughs> standards are really important because if you have people that are baptized too quickly, they just become a liability and they don't, they don't really provide, they don't become a resource to their congregation and it just drags on the leadership, especially internationally where leadership is so limited as it is. Um, opening new areas of proselytism is a huge factor for growth. That's one of the reasons why the church in West Africa most recently has grown so rapidly. Places like in, in Cote d'Ivoire and Ivory Coast, um, you know, 10 years ago there were only about six, seven cities with a church presence, and now there's about 45, which is a dramatic increase. Um, another one is self-sufficiency and leadership. So using Cote d'Ivoire as an example, again, um, mission presidents in Cote d'Ivoire for the past 10 or so years, 10 almost 15 years have been all Ivorian. They haven't been from North America. So that's also been a big driver for growth. And up until just this past year or so, missionaries that serve in Cote d'Ivoire are only from Africa. So self-sufficiency is huge for growth in the, in the LDS church for that being growth that continues and that can accelerate as well. A sense of LDS community is also very important. If there's not a sense of LDS community, the church, people emigrate to the United States or another country with a strong church presence usually. Um, you know, but, and also some of the comments earlier about, you know, why don't we have a more diverse, um, body of general authorities and, and, and also in the quorum of the 12, a lot of that also is, I would argue it based on a lot of the findings that I've done with the Kimura foundation is because the church struggles in, in most countries in the world, just to staff their local needs. If they call people into those positions, then the local needs suffer more because they don't have a local leader to meet that need. And there's many countries in the world where the church is strongly dependent, if not almost entirely dependent, on foreign missionaries to properly function. Um, so I think those, those are some of the big findings that we've found so far. Thank you. We have about 35 minutes left. I have one more question. I think I might hold fire on that. It's kind of a general question, kind of lessons learned. I think you've, you've, you've done actually a, a good job of kind of setting the stage for, for that. Um, but I think we'll, at this point, turn to you as the audience. I know there are researchers here, some of you so-called scientists, you meddler, um, and others who are <laughs> political scientists. Um, but uh, I, again, there are others with research experience and background in this area. Um, so if, you, if you're going to ask a question or if you're a researcher, want to make a comment, 
addressing some of the questions I've raised. Identify yourself, because there are people here who would like to follow up and know what you're doing. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and turn to Q&A, please. It was Nigeria. Well, the way I was going to frame the question, so recently you've written that in Nigeria there are now three different areas where missionaries are now being deployed in the north of Nigeria, which is typically predominantly or heavily Islamic. Uh, so my question is, explain that, and or how did you find that out, or both? That was my question. Is that of interest? Should we go there? Okay, go ahead, Matt. Sure. Well, in, in Nigeria this past year, uh, in 2017, there was 100 and I think it was 101 or it was 102 new congregations created in one year, which is the most new congregations created in a single country outside the United States since the Philippines in the year 2000. So that's a pretty significant development. Uh, very rapid growth in West Africa right now. Um, but in terms of addressing your question about the northern part of Nigeria, so I believe it's the very first time in Kaduna State we've had missionaries assigned. They just split the ward in Kaduna. There's a branch there now, too. Um, and also in Jos and, and Bauchi. There was a mission that was created in Jos in 1992, and the church relocated it to Enugu in 1993. Um, that was due to concerns, mainly my understandings, with the Christian Muslim violence in the middle belt of Nigeria. Um, but the way I found out that information about those areas opening to missionary work was through surveys that were completed by local members or returned missionaries that served in the Nigerian Nugu mission. And they report on those areas opening to proselytism. Some of them appears to be the first time, and there's been branches in those cities since the early 90s, but because of those safety concerns, no missionaries have really been serving there for the past 25 years. Does that imply some kind of change in policy that uh, going I, along with your the earlier The church in, in West Africa is becoming more and more comfortable with proselyting in traditionally Muslim areas in West Africa. Now, they're not targeting Muslims. They're targeting Christians in those areas to proselyte to, um, but more comfortable moving in those areas. So Senegal just had missionaries assigned about a month ago. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, also, in, um, in Mali right now, the church is working towards getting something worked out with the government there with assigning full-time missionaries to, to um, Bamako. Um, and also, a branch was just created in Guinea for the first time. So we're seeing a, a, a new chapter in growth in West Africa into these traditionally Muslim countries. Um, you know, really the, the biggest development with multiple countries like this we've seen since the rest of the Balkans opened the missionary work about five, six years ago, like Kosovo, Macedonia, and Montenegro. So, so that's pretty significant. OK, thank you. Thank you. Please. What mission? They aren't their own missions. I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guinea-Bissau as a young woman. At that time, the, the Portugal-Lisbon mission sent missionaries rotating in and out from Cabo Bear. But nobody in Guinea-Bissau or, what did you just say, Senegal? Mali. And so are they their own missions or are they part of Nigeria? No, and, and those countries weren't assigned to missions until recently, and only a couple of them are. And actually in Mali, only the area around Bamako is assigned to a mission. The rest of it's assigned to the Africa West area. Um, but yeah, Guinea-Bissau is still not assigned to a mission. Oh, it'll be a while. But if, yeah. so it's, it's missionaries that are there under the authority of the area authority? No, for the well, once they're assigned to a mission, that mission will supervise the proselyting there. So Senegal is assigned to the West Mission in Abidjan and, and Cote d'Ivoire, and then Mali is assigned to the the regular Cote d'Ivoire Abidjan mission. So and Guinea's assigned to Sierra Leone. Wow, Sierra Thank Leone you. has a mission. Yeah, it's had a mission since two thousand seven. Okay. Please. We heard of uh, colonial. Anybody in particular, or just for the panel as a whole, who would like to who'd like to take a whack? Um, Henry, please. I mean, there's two sides to that. On the one hand, you can look at something like what we tend to think of the most standardized kind of globalization effort, global corporations, um, franchise holders. Take McDonald's. McDonald's, you tend to think, is totally standardized. The, f the food is, but not the eating experience. In the US, I noticed here, people go to McDonald's, they're in 10 minutes, they sometimes don't even take their cards off, and they're out, or they do the drive-in. 
In Latin America, I've seen whole families on Sunday afternoons, two, three hours in McDonald's, children playing there, some uncles and aunts drop in, they go leave again. So my point is what looks standardized may have totally different uses locally. So that's one thing. The Mormon church, we all know, looks the same all over the world. The manuals are the same. It's all, you know, thanks to correlation and the managers, it's all heavily standardized. But what happens on the ground, right? We heard from Melissa part of that. We know there's plenty of studies from Latin America. John Hawkins years ago t wrote a little wonderful little article about the problems in Guatemala that said, you know, let's have the singles meet on the weekday night, except that in many towns in Guatemala, that was very dangerous and you don't want to do that. So uh, my point is, there is probably a lot of local things changing, but if we don't study it, we're not gonna know about it, right? right? That's the problem. The other issue I think still is, so it's an international church and what does it mean? Is it still totally Wasatron based, the way it's managed? I'd say, you know, I had a bet with Mark Grover years ago on um, how long it would take to have a Latin American on not just general authorities, we have plenty of those, but the Quorum of the Twelve, right? Not to mention a president, right? And that issue itself, I think, you know, once I brought it up, the only people who openly talked about it in Central America were actually bishops in Costa Rica and Guatemala, and they were pretty critical about it. They thought it didn't help the church, that it was so North American and even was a front in its orientation. They wanted more involvement I think the decentralization that, of course, has happened in the Mormon church and the, uh, the increased role of the area office, I think, is part of a recognition that there has to be more local adaptation. But you still see there's so much standardized going on, right? Uh, how it works out, again, you won't know until you do research on it or until some member feels that they can write about it. But I think uh, what puzzles me is that I'm still not entirely sure what the church wants to do. And I suspect part of the reason is because the upper membership of the church is probably not entirely unified in what they want to do. And this has happened, of course, throughout Mormon history is that you have different people on the 70, on the 12, and you have different tendencies, and the combined effort of all of that swings the church kind of back and forth. And sometimes, you know, and most people, the Mormon watchers know who are the more liberal, who are the more conservative, who are the more open, who are the more standardized. So I think, and the problem, of course, not just in Mormonism, but in many religions, that is totally not accessible to research. So frankly, we don't know. We see occasionally signs when, you know, the church takes a stance on immigration, for instance. I think that was a big thing. So we see signs, and it's kind of like reading the signs, but it's kind of like when in the old days was called Kremlin watching, right? Kremlin criminology, right? What was happening in the Kremlin or with the new election of the new pope? I mean, that is all hidden from sight and is not accessible. And I would, you know, it'd be great if we could do research on it. But some issue that briefly came up that, sorry for getting back to it, it's true that on the 70, the first quorum, there are Latin Americans, but there are, as far as I know, or maybe one or two North American Latinos. And it's true that, totally true what Suhei said, that the Latin Americans who are on the 70 are all mostly business people or professionals from higher classes. And I think it's not done on purpose, but that's the way the church leadership system works out in the end. The people with that kind of background tend to be the people who gravitate towards the upward leadership positions. As social scientists, it's up to us to analyze why that happens. Any other comments in response to the question, about Colleen? Caroline, please. Um, yeah, I would say that when I think back to my time in Mexico, um, people would, when they gave talks in church, they were carrying those teachings of the presidents of the church manuals and they would use them and they would quote from them. And from talking to them, it seemed like most of the people said that they found that these things were more helpful than oppressive, like these, these manuals that, you know, in one, if you look at it in one way, it is so colonial and imperial to be like, you know, shoving these messages down on them and quoting all these white men. But talking to people on the ground, they didn't seem to have problems with the standardized manuals. Um, but what did come out in Mexico, the one place where, I, where they, they articulated tension and where they articulated feeling sort of the imperial weight coming from the Utah church was when the high school Bene Merito was closed about five years ago. And um, this was very upsetting to the Mexican women I spoke to. 
Um, this was an LDS boarding school where they they sent all their kids and they loved this place so much and it was and it was closed without um, any any consultation with the with the community in Mexico and so that was the one place where they felt like yeah there there was a power issue going on and they wished they had been consulted. And one thing I wanted to add too to answer your question is I would say that the two main ways I see that kind of um, colonialism with the growth of the church is in regards to language use and meeting houses. Um, because you see the sort of meeting houses that maybe fit in in, in uh, you know United States being built in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo or Mongolia, and they really stand out and they do not look like they fit at all. Um, and also, they're also not very cost effective either. I've had previous mission presidents inform me about that and say, you know, this you know, this very expensive meeting house, the materials weren't even from our country, and were brought here, and now we have this meeting house that doesn't fit in the neighborhood, and it gives people this wrong impression of the local church there. And then language use is another major issue. Um, and in, there are many countries in the church where missionaries will only teach people that speak certain languages. If you don't speak that language, then they won't teach you, unless there's somebody who can translate, perhaps. But that's been another challenge for growth is because um, the church has been very selective on what languages it will proselyte and translate materials into and which ones it will not. Thank you. Patrick. All right, so uh, uh, one question for uh, Matt that anybody could talk about and then another one for the whole panel. So, so Matt, uh, and, and uh, actually both of these are kind of about the uh, relationship and responsibilities of the researcher to your subjects, okay? So, so Matt, I can imagine a uh, uh, setting in which some statistics or some information about the church could be sensitive and could actually possibly, the accurate reporting of uh, data could be problematic for church members right. in a particular locale. So I want you to talk about the ethics of that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And so there are sensitive countries where we won't publish information on where church units are or like in mainland China, for example. I mean, we have that information, but we don't publish it because uh, it's sensitive. And the church has a very, um, you know, they're very careful with that to make sure the members there are safe and to make sure everything's done legally. Um, you know, or, you know, for example, um, in terms of, um, you know, where, you know, convert retention rates maybe in some areas or member activity rates. But even that, I mean, usually we don't have too many issues with that. That's because people don't know where it is. You know, we're not going to publish the activity rate for a specific unit, you know, necessarily because, for one, I don't know if anyone really would care much about that, but also it might be used in some malicious way, you know, perhaps by a counter proselyting group or something like that. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, that's, I mean, and also a lot of, to just sort of, I mean, we'll get information that's very detailed about particular church leaders or um, situations, particular congregations that are pretty sensitive that, you know, we just don't report on. We might just say, you know, this country has had issues with proper handling of church finances by local leaders, but not indicating where exactly, perhaps, or something like that. Others want to comment on the same question? Um, well, I am a social scientist, but I also try not to hurt my interview subjects, obviously. Um, I also make it anonymous, though you run into problems, right? So you have to anonymize basically the ward or where it is and the leaders, because if you don't, even if you just describe it, like in Costa Rica or Guatemala, some people might be able to figure out where it is. So you have to figure out ways to do that. Now, to recognize themselves in it, I must admit, I have shared my findings mostly with LDS leaders. So bishops, people on the Elders Quorum, the Relief Society, and they, they got it. They really were interested in my research, uh, in some, not always, but in some cases, they recognized themselves in it. But interesting enough, if I'd been somewhere a long time, I'm talking at least half a year or longer, and I'd build up kind of what I, you know, I might almost call friendships in the church, although it's not real friendships because I'm a researcher and I'll be gone in another half a year. But sometimes my friends felt a bit hurt because they were looking at things in the church very differently. And when I uh, let them read, for instance, an article in the Tico Times, the Costa Rican uh, English language newspaper, some of my friends were a bit hurt because they suddenly realized that even though they thought of me basically as a member, of, as an Ingrat person, that my perspective was totally different, that I was writing about leadership and machismo and cultural issues, mm -hmm. whereas they just thought about the spiritual aspects. Salvation. God's kingdom on earth, 
the afterlife. So they suddenly realized it brought to them very much home like, okay, yeah, Henry is a nice guy, but he's really an anthropologist. And his way of looking at the world is really is different ours. from our way. That, that can be a shock, yeah. right? And I think it's a shock that happens to many ethnographers, right? Um, I think it's also a good thing in part, right? There's different ways of looking at the world. I am uncomfortable with the idea that there's only one lens, only one theor theory, only one way, only one approved perspective. I like diversity. I like, uh, I am uh, a theoretical eclecticist. No, I am proud of that. Some people in my department think that's really a very bad word. And they are what I would call theoretical fundamentalists, but they don't like it when I call them that. I think I'll leave it there. Here, and, and maybe I'll. Um, that question you asked, Patrick, is something that, you know, as you know, has kept me up at night, how to be responsible uh, to the people who have shared with me their stories and their lives. Um, one thing I've done is that after I've, I've transcribed an oral history is I'll send it back to the person and tell them, you can, you can do whatever you want with this. You can cross things out. If you are uncomfortable with what you said, you can change it. And then, and I will quote from your revised version. Uh, I want this to be something that you feel comfortable with. So that's that's the first step I've taken to try to try to be ethical to them and to give them a chance to amend or take back what they what they said if they were uncomfortable with it. Um, the next, you know, what will happen next, I think, is before I publish, like you, I think I would probably send them my paper and say, what do you, you know, it, what do you think? And um, is there something you have an issue with in terms of my interpretive lens here? And I would have that conversation with them, and I would probably try to hash it out and come to a point where we can agree on something. I don't actually don't know. This is this is something I'm going to have to figure out when the time comes, um, if it ever comes to this. But I think in the end, it might have to be something like, "Here's my interpretation of it." However, it's important to know that the interview subjects had this interpretation of it, and I might just put those two interpretations right side by side, right in the article. And I'm not afraid of doing that because part of feminist research methodology is to use the first person. It is to reveal um, the, the researcher and who she is and where she's coming from and to not be afraid of using uh, the first person. So I, I think I could do that, and I think that might be an ethical solution. We have three researchers burning desire to say something. Please identify yourself for So Tom Lynn Rutherford, and okay. I do Mormonism in India. And so I'm thinking in terms of we're representing a lot of Christian nations and some of these questions about um, how transparent we could be in things and, and, and how transparent the church is, as well as um, just the work itself varies. So maybe I just open it up to people that are working in Asia and in other areas to talk about how that changes when we're dealing with non-Christian populations. Do you want to share a thought about that? How it does change? Well, it changes <laughs> No, no, please. That's that's welcome. Medler, did you want to um, jump in? Okay. Haiku? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, I think we also have to be clear about the audiences that we're writing for, right? So I'm big on book to book family. Um, and I think that there's a lot of people that are going to be like, that's too much information. But I think part of it, too, is just like, who are the audiences? I mean, you know, when I'm uh, writing for, you know, American Quarterly, that's an academic audience. Unless someone in my family, my community, whatever, is going on to higher education, they're not going to encounter this book. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking to a particular audience, and so I'm using terminology and language and writing in a particular way to speak to that particular audience. And so I think we also have to think about that when we're doing our work. Um, and then also I think, you know, for me, because I was interviewing people who are, who I consider to be my aunties and uncles, you know, that kind of sense of who am I obligated to, like, 
can I go home and not get in trouble for this? You know, and so, so um, you know, one of those things, and every researcher I think has to ask that question of themselves, is like, you know, am I gonna shame the family for this one? And, um, you know, and will I be able to sleep at night, and will it also be um, recognizable and meet the standards of, of the academy? And honestly, that's part of it too, that it's an industry, and, and the um, requirements of meeting the expectations of that industry are also very different than meeting the expectations of family and community. And so, you know, it's a lot to make, negotiate and navigate, and I think positionality and where folks are at really matters. And it's also useful to have peer reviewers to help us see what we can't see because we're so close to research. Thank you. Please. Well, uh, just an additional comment. I mean, we've, we've been talking so much about the, the void of information and the, the dark mass that is global warming studies at this point. And I think understanding that to open up those doors and to open up the additional research that we need in order to really fill the gaps that exist, that the audience has to be you know, the, the institutional church to a certain extent in order for that information to come forward and for the church as an institution to be more comfortable to outsiders coming in to do additional research to move the church forward because there have been so many wonderful things that we've discussed over this conference that need to make movement in the institutional church. So I think that as a research is also a heavy burden to carry um, that I'm sure is on, on the forefront of a lot of research. Thank you, thank you. Please, Carter, or no, gentleman next to you, please. I would like to say that I have felt like, and I'm outside myself in this uh, milieu, I have uh, published uh, my uh, thesis, my research, in uh, New Time, and uh, but as a, a member of the church, uh, I, um, I think it's good to be learned, and, and of course this is doctrine, if, um, if you use it in a good way. And I appreciate very much this conference. Uh, I uh, <clears throat> have been a professor, I've been an analyzer most of my career, <clears throat> and uh, I see that this is more of a way of understanding things, understanding the, um, the, uh, the, the outside of the church, the, uh, the uh, gender person that's really concerned about gender, <laughs> the um, statistician, which I think is very important, and the dabbler. I think we, what we buy is, uh, is I'm a dabbler more than anything else because we can't, we can't know everything. In the but I, I would like to maybe expand the scope of geographical and what, what we've been talking about <clears throat> to all the differences that we have, <clears throat> including uh, age, uh, <clears throat> um, health, mental, and physical. <clears throat> That's another big problem of our nation, is understanding what mental ill. <clears throat> um, I have come here because I have, I'm very, well, I'm very interested in, in global activity. Uh, I have a French wife, <clears throat> um, so uh, I have a, a friend in, <clears throat> in um, the Cartier, <clears throat> and um, we spoke both of us in French. I went on a French mission. <clears throat> and um, and I'm um, also studying uh, extensive literature in general, uh, especially English and, and French. <clears throat> uh, so uh, I would like to thank you for, for your participation and for your argument in this conference. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Do you have one more comment from the audience? Carter, did you want to make a point or perhaps yield the floor to the gentleman in the gold coat? I'd rather not be the last word. Okay. <laughs> I, I call him not the, the last word, but uh, there are definitely uh, some things that we need to learn and some things that um, I would have liked to comment on, but probably just, uh,
I'm just going to ask that. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I've been pondering about you know, the, uh, the question of methodology and also the things that uh, we um, would like to see as uh, Mormonism goes global. Well, it's been going global for a long time as we are studying it globally. <laughs> um, we get also to see the challenges both uh, for Mormonism, but also the challenges for us as researchers. Um, we talk about colonialism. What if we, as researchers, we all we also uh, agents of that? That is, when we go uh, study uh, Mormonism in a setting like Haiti, right? Um, I thought it was quite interesting. Caroline, you brought up the question that you know the uh, women they wouldn't address uh, questions that were of uh, interest to gender, race. Could it be that it wasn't only because you were wide and women were asking the question, could it be that it wasn't relevant to them? That what was relevant to them in Mormonism was uh, daily uh, concerns in terms of um, how can I become a better Mormon in my context, in my own culture. So I'm, I'm asking myself that because sometimes I wonder if we do not activate problems that are not there. Caroline, do you mind taking a minute, maybe restating your, your finding about moral imperatives? Because I think it might be timely, right? Uh -huh. just to... Yeah, well, what, what you just mentioned is actually one of the, the big insights I had as I was doing this uh, dissertation in that, yeah, the thing that was of concern to me, which was gender equality, uh, was not generally of concern to many of the women I spoke with because like you said, they had different moral imperatives. They had a different um, paradigm through which they viewed the world. Um, and it's, it's certainly not any worse than mine. You know, it's different than mine. It was a different moral imperative and it was one, the the way I articulated it, it was one about um, they privileged building healthy and vitalizing relationships with their communities, with their families, with their husbands, with their children, with their God, and with themselves. That was sort of the driving moral imperative that seemed to um, affect so many of their decisions and the way and the way they interacted with the world. Uh, and and of course, and now it's different than the paradigm of gender equality. You know, when when I as a feminist view the world and the church. I look for structural inequity and I see it, you know, but that was not, that was not what the, was their concern. So I think you brought up a really, really important thing um, as researchers to be aware of these spaces of disconnect and to sit back and to let them tell their stories. That was one thing I really did want to do, even though I came in with something of an agenda in terms of wanting to understand how people navigated patriarchy. Um, I also came in wanting to know their stories and I was many times, um, I sat back and I let them tell their stories and I didn't ask the questions that I wanted, you know, I was personally, you know, a little more interested in, but I felt like that was the more ethical way to let their stories emerge, to let their agendas emerge, rather than me pushing my agendas onto them. This, uh, if I may, this is why I think it becomes very interesting to be uh, uh, an outsider somehow, and, you know, an observer. Uh, and I like, um, I mean, my cover is not anymore, but I remember in my early days visiting Utah, I would pretend that I'm not a Mormon. I would sing into a word and pretend and ask questions and answer. And then in the afternoon, or after the pleasant meeting was over, I would go to the Arlingas Church and then the Catholic Church. I'm just here observing. I'll take whatever I get and then we'll see what to do with it. And sometimes it's also very uh, a rewarding fact to see the kind of things that just show to us, show, show themselves for us and that in fact orient our research in directions that we would have thought. Thank you. Well, we've come to the end. I'm going to take uh, maybe 60 seconds to make two quick points and then we'll thank the, the panel. Uh, just about the importance of, of global Mormon studies. Um, my mentor while I was at BYU was a professor named Lamont Tullis. He's now in his early 80s. And because of his efforts, I think almost single-handedly, you can go to the Mexico 
page of LDS.org and find about 25 articles on local, if you will, LDS members of the church important to Mexican history of the LDS church in Mexico. And also a collection of lessons for use on the fifth Sunday that have to do with local church history in Mexico. So the idea, the notion, again, of the historians, uh, kind of kissing up to Patrick here, but the, the change that has come about in uh, the church because of the focus on history is significant. I think the decentralization of church history that I think is underway, when, is it ongoing yet or is it just underway? Anyway, um, is, is significant. And I think what one person, again, like Lamont Tullis can do. Um, secondly, I've been part, almost 30 years now, part of a discussion on national security, Mormon perspectives on war, peace, and national security. And it is painful how polarized that debate, how uh, I don't think toxic is yet the word, but it's close. Um, and it just struck me that uh, in, in undertaking a project with participation of some of the people in this room a few years ago, how important it is to get non-North American perspectives on what war means. Uh, most of the membership of the church, whatever activity rates you assign to them, uh, there are significant percentages of the church that don't have the experience with war that North Americans do. I mean, since Pearl Harbor, you could probably count in minutes the number of uh, times that large-scale violence has erupted in our, on our soil. And that's not the case with Nicaragua. It's not the case with Democratic Republic of Congo, Kosovo, wherever else. So the importance to get non-North American LDS perspectives on important topics that will affect us as a church and affect us as a society, along with robotics uh, and artificial intelligence. Um, just so important. So whatever you might do, however you might feel you can contribute, uh, it's, an, it's an important thing. And just salutations and thanks to our panel for their efforts in this regard. If you'll join me. Thank you, Fred. Thanks to this terrific panel. Uh, we've reached the, the end of the conference, and it's, uh, for me, it's been a very stimulating and rewarding two days. I'm really grateful for all of you for your attendance, and especially grateful for all of the conference participants. Uh, as well. And, and uh, so one more round of applause for the participants and also all the support staff that made this possible. Before we adjourn, uh, Carter asked me to make an announcement of a, of a conference that will happen uh, exactly one year from now. So March 7th through 10th in uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, called Decentered Mormonism, Assessing 180 Years of International Expansion. Uh, so it'll uh, consider many of the similar themes that, that we had here today. It looks like they'll be looking for, uh, for papers from both well-established scholars, but kind of young and upcoming scholars as well, and I think looking for, for new voices. And so, um, Carter, is there going to be a website, or how are people going to learn more about this uh, in time? Okay, good. So, so put that on your calendars, and we'll all see each other in Haiti in one year. So uh, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, thanks for your participation and your support, and safe travels home. Thank you very much. Thank you.